Well, this is it. We're going to begin now. This is uh, the online session Bankability Consideration for Large Scale PV Projects in a Stressed Global Environment. Um, welcome, everyone. I can see there are a lot of people from many different places. Uh, I've seen people from Germany, from Saudi Arabia, from Oman, from Ghana, even. So, welcome, everyone. Please keep sharing. And uh, today with us, we have uh, four experts that are going to be talking about this, um, this, um, this topic. And I'd like to thank our partner, uh, Messier, the Middle East uh, Solar Energy Association, who has actually organized this with us. So thank you very much for making this possible. And now, right ahead, I'd like to ask Gurmit. Gurmit, I'm going to start with you, if you don't mind. I'm going to take your microphone off mute. Could you please introduce yourself and your company? Yes, hi, Belen. Uh, thank you very much. And um, I'm very pleased to be here today. And it's really delighted to see so many attending this webinar. So as Belen mentioned, I'm uh, Gurmeet based in Dubai, and I'm here representing Messia. I've been a board member of Messia now for a couple of years. And as you know, our role is to try and promote and develop the solar industry within the uh, MENA region. I also am a partner in a law firm called Pinson Masons. We are a global law firm and we practice in energy and infrastructure. My personal area of practice has been uh, in particular, you know, energy and renewable energies in the GCC region. I've been here for over 12 years now. I've been working on uh, most of the major uh, utility scale and also smaller scale solar projects throughout the GCC. Thank you very much, Gurmit. I'm gonna ask now Sophia to please introduce you yourself. Thanks, Belen. Um, so nice to meet uh, everyone online on this forum. So yeah, my name is Sophia. I'm based in Dubai. And I am working with NG uh, based in Dubai. So basically covering uh, Middle East, South Central Asia and Turkey. Um, I work in the business development field and mainly in renewables. I've been working in renewables for 10 years now um, globally. No one would say by looking at you. You look like you just come out of university, Sophia. Amy, <laughs> please introduce yourself. Hi, Balan. Thank you. So, hi, everybody. A nice e meeting with you through this webinar. It's really good chance to talk with everyone through the through this uh, webinar. So, uh, I'm Amy New from Longji Solar and in charge of the global BD department. So right now I'm in Shanghai, China. So, you know, due to the coronavirus, it's not available for me to fly everywhere outside of the China, but I'm still free in China. So um, for Global BD department, we are much focused on the strategic customer development in the overseas market. So, well, but I'm not sure if everybody knows Longji Solar or not. So I would like to give you a very bit late, a little uh, you know, very bit little introduction about it. So, uh, Longji Solar, Longji Solar is the world leading solar manufacturers. Uh, and we are running the whole production chain from the solar monocrystalline silicon wafer cells and modules and the production capacity from the mono, pro uh, mono products, I mean, have, be have become the largest one in the world. So, as and based on the annual shipment volume, the 7.4 gigawatts in, in the year 2019, we have been ranked the number four in the PV industry. Actually, not only on the production scale, but also on the financial strengths and the inno innovative technology. And we are also staying the leading position in the market. So that's why, you know, the long solar can be qualified by some famous third parties with a premium evaluation. So uh, for instance, you know, we just ranked, uh, we just have been ranked as the triple, triple A rated bank, bankable PV manufacturer by the PV tech. And so far, it is the only one company ranked as the triple A. Um, and coming back to the utility skill uh, solar project, this is quite interesting topic of today. Okay. So we have contributed, you know, large volume of the solar, uh, solar modules in the past five years in the market and including the Middle East. Actually, you know, we have been determined in dig in our business opportunities in Middle East since more and more large scale installation capacities 
have been released in the following two to three years. So therefore, um, we are quite active to support our customers in order to help them to win the bid. So uh, this is a brief introduction about us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to ask Alvin to please introduce yourself and your company shortly. Yes, thanks, Clint. Hi, good morning, everyone. So this is the Alvin Shi for Sangro. I'm the managing director for Sangro Mila Regions. So about the Sangro, as the, based on the Bloomberg report, it was the most, both, most bankable in water suppliers. And uh, by end of 2019, Sangro is the first inverter manufacturer who hit 100 gigawatts of community insulation globally. And uh, in MENA regions, we also uh, almost reached one gigawatt installation here, and uh, our team are based in Dubai. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Alvin. Great. Okay, so I'd like, thank you very much, uh, Anna, for taking that off. And uh, now we'd like, this is going to be a little bit of a special webinar because we're not going to have presentations today. We just have, um, we're going to introduce the concepts and we're going to have like a conversation around the topics here. So let me just paint the picture a little bit and create the context so that we can understand what we're discussing here today. So we obviously mm, are, have, are going through a, a crisis, you know, most of the world right now is in a lockdown, not all of the world, but most of the world. And this has completely changed the way we understand our lives, whether personal or professional. And um, it's also changed, you know, the way industries work. Um, and we're going to have an immense economic crisis, like the whole world, like most of the countries as a result of this. So here today, we're going to be talking about some of the items, you know, that are surrounding our our industry because our industry doesn't really like work and operate on its own in a vacuum, but it works in a, in a world that is very much interconnected. So we have several issues, you know, here we have COVID, you know, at the moment, what is going on, you know, what's happening with the projects that are happening right now. Then is COVID in the future. How is this going to affect the industry? There is definitely issues of bankability and how, you know, all of this crisis is going to affect the bankability of projects and even you know, the fact that money would be available for this kind of projects. But we're also dealing with other situations, such as an oil crisis, as we can see. So it's a number of things coming together. And here's what we're going to discuss today. So first of all, I'd like to focus kind of like in the COVID-19 situation, you know, how we got here, um, we already know, but what has that mean for the projects that are currently ongoing? And then we will also talk about the projects that are going on for the future. So to start with this topic, I'd like to ask, I'm going to open your, uh, your microphones, okay? And I'm going to ask uh, Sophia, for example, to start, okay, so what is your perspective uh, you know, as a developer and everything that is happening and how you're handling it, what are the issues that are sort of worrying you? Let's do two things. First, focus on the projects that, are, you know, have already gone or that are ongoing and then on the future projects and how that is affecting you. Yeah, indeed. So, um, thanks, Belen. Actually, we can break it down into three things, projects under development, under construction and in operation. So for projects under development, I think uh, the uncertainty of it all will mainly impact the, the, the cost of funding of, of the banks that are lending in, in these projects. You know, in some countries, uh, the, the oil prices uh, and the fiscal and the difficulties that this may cause will impact the ability of banks to, to fund that competitive cost. Uh, also, there may be difficulties in accessing dollars in, in, in some countries as well. So these will uh, likely impact the, 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 maybe the prices or the competitiveness of such projects. And the second thing, which maybe my colleague Amy will, can comment on later on, is the supply chain. Um, we don't know yet how the supply chain will be impacted for the future develop, uh, projects that are expected to be developed and how the prices of the modules and so on, how that will evolve. So it's the whole uncertainty around the COVID. Then the second um, part will be the projects under construction. What this may mean is that, you know, <laughs> with the current restrictions imposed in most countries is that it will be difficult to get manpower on site, for example, for construction, especially for PV projects, it's quite manpower intensive. The, the civil portion installation is quite an important por portion in, in PV, as you know. Um, so these kind of movement restrictions will likely cause delays and then that can be handled and then the contracts I think will meet will we'll, we'll tackle on that later on. 
then for the projects under operation, it's quite of a similar issue because, you know, during the ONM, sometimes you have certain um, experts that come, let, let's take an example of um, the inverters, for instance, you may need some experts that can either are licensed to work on that specific brand or, or, or model. So these are the small issues you, you might face during the during the, the ONM or the operation phase. That being said, I see the ONM impact for renewables lower than what it could be for a conventional plant, for example, just because of the simplicity of it all during the operations period. Um, so this is in a nutshell how we see it play in all these three phases of the project. Right, thank you very much, Sofia. Definitely the bankability issue. Uh, there is so many other things happening, right? That is hard to really quite ascertain. However, we are having also some surprising news coming out of our tenders at the moment, but we'll go into that a little bit later uh, with record prices when also at the same time security is going up. So it's qu quite like a, an interesting uh, dynamic growing in here. Gurmit, I'd like to ask you now to your perspective. I know that in particular, you know, the, the contractual side, you must be going crazy right now, revising contracts, revising course majors. I suppose the question is very similar to you is like, what is happening right now and what does it mean going forward, you know, all of this um, crisis for contracts? Great, thank you very much for that question. Um, just before I, I answer that question, just touching on the background that you mentioned, yes, it is quite a catastrophic time, uh, you know, both in terms of uh, impact on persons, but also the economy. And I think in particular for GCC with the lowering of the oil prices as well, there's been a lot of speculation on how that's going to mean a contraction of our GDP. Um, and I think one question that would you know, obviously be in everybody's minds is what do we see in terms of projects moving forward? So I think it's fair enough to say that uh, although, you know, we do expect a contraction in, in the GCC, uh, the governments in this region have certainly shown a commitment towards renewable energy projects. And, you know, that's very uh, positive news. So for example, we've seen repto round three now still going ahead despite COVID. And uh, as you've just mentioned, you know, we've also seen some record low prices just being announced today in Abu Dhabi, uh, despite, you know, a rebate during the period of COVID, which I can, you know, touch on a bit uh, later on as well. Personally, as a, as a lawyer, in terms of our uh, work with our clients at the moment, uh, we act for a number of developers and contractors who are either bidding for projects or already implementing projects. And one thing we've definitely seen is uh, the increase in uh, the number of claims that uh, is coming through. And um, that has impact both in terms of time, extension of time type claims, but also claims for cost. And the nature of this has been uh, mainly around force majeure type uh, claims and also claims for like change in law type uh, provisions. And, um, you know, I think it's probably useful to just give some background for, for the benefit of the viewers. Um, you know, force majeure is actually uh, a concept that originated in French civil law system. It's basically uh, providing for relief to parties when you've got an extraordinary event that happens. Uh, under, you know, common law systems such as English law, force majeure is very much a creature of contract. So you don't uh, get it as a general law concept, but it's very much dependent on what is in your contract itself. So it becomes very important to look at the contract and to see what provisions provide for relief. And, um, you know, I can certainly go into more detail uh, as well a bit later on into the ins and outs of it. But we are definitely seeing an increase in terms of, uh, you know, uh, claims for both uh, uh, natural force measure events. And these are events that happen naturally. And you would often find in contracts, uh, certainly for the utility scale projects in this region, there are very well-defined provisions uh, that deal with force measure. So in some respects, parties don't need to actually go beyond and to look at, at the principles of the law because your contract itself will provide quite adequate remedies and uh, they often cover things such as epidemic and, and plague, which is the more biblical concept. But so, you know, the corona situation would uh, fall within the context of epidemic of plague. And then if you look at government action that's been taken in, in response to corona, 
So for example, the lockdowns, the restriction in working hours and the like, uh, <clears throat> you know, to the extent that these have the force of law and in a number of countries, as you know, they have issued directives and circulars that do have the force of law, then potentially there could be claims for a uh, change in law or what is known as political force measure provisions as well in, in the contract. Uh, as we say to all of our clients, it's very important they, they follow the process that's provided in the contract. And often the contract would have very detailed notice provisions that you have to give. You will also have to mitigate your losses, meaning that you, know, you should look at alternative type uh, solutions. For example, are there alternative suppliers who can provide you, uh, you know, materials in terms of shortages of labor do you have alternative uh, workforce? For example, locally, you can't hire uh, labor from abroad. And then, for example, also looking at uh, whether, you know, if you can't get labor onto the site, whether you can, uh, you know, have uh, labor accommodation close to the site. So all this needs to be explored. And most importantly, you need to have, you know, good records, contemporaneous records, and then uh, to ensure that you preserve your rights. I mean, related to that, I think one thing that would come up more is, um, you know, uh, there will be, and we are starting to see this actually, there's been concern from lenders um, in terms of um, how this risk would be managed and how this risk will be mitigated. So uh, for projects that are coming up to financial close, for example, I think people will find that credit approvals within the banking system might just take a lot longer because banks would want to be convinced that, you know, these risks can be mitigated and, and most importantly, how these extra costs would be funded. So either you need to build in extra contingencies or, you know, you need to find a solution with the procurer. And in this case, this is where the claims for force measure and change in law will come in use, useful because uh, you, would, you would seek for compensation either by way of a lump sum payment or either by way of a tariff adjustment. But these are things that uh, I think the procurer side as well will need to step up and then uh, give a clear indication uh, one way or the other how these are going to be treated. So I would expect to see that there will be more dialogue as well happening with uh, procurers and contractors and developers. And that is the sensible way of moving forward it's still very early days, so we don't know what the outcome of all of this is going to be. But a sensible approach towards this is to actually have that dialogue early, to have, you know, to work collaboratively, because obviously it's in the interest of everyone for projects to proceed and not to be mired down in, you know, contentious claims. Yeah, this is a question that I wanted to ask all of the lawyers, you know, out there, please, can you tell me who stops the buck in a force majeure case situation? Like, who has ultimately, you know, to pick up, the, I suppose, the costs of those delays? Because um, this is something I never understood. Is it the EBC? Is it the, the, the tendering part? I mean, who? Because eventually all of those extra costs, where are they going to come from? Yeah, that's, it's not the banks. So <laughs> it's a very good question, but you know that's why the banks in particular are, put, are very worried because um, uh, we need answers to these questions, and it comes back ultimately again to your contract. And um, like I said earlier, one of the benefits of you know the way projects have been procured in in this part of the world is it's had the benefit of a very long and uh, tested IPP program because a lot of the renewable uh, projects are based on, you know, the conventional uh, power projects. Uh, so the documentations are all very well drafted. It's well understood. They're very clear provisions. And uh, most of them do provide for some form of relief. The parties would get relief from the obligations. You do get an, a, a claim for an extension of time if it's a natural force measure. So meaning if it's a natural uh, disaster. And then uh, if it's uh, something that's related to acts of government, so uh, political force measure, then you do get compensation also for increased costs. So it comes down very much to actually following the contractual process, making sure you've got records, mitigating, and then uh, you know being able to make those claims. 
to the extent that you don't have a contractual right, then I think the answer would be, again, how you pass down that risk uh, throughout the contractual change. So in this case, you know, those kind of risks will be passed down to the EPC. And I guess, unfortunately, the answer then is, you know, the EPC would have to bear that risk. And you would often find as well in all of these uh, projects that there is a concept of equivalent project relief. So basically the EPC would agree that his or her relief really is, is limited to what the company or the developer obtains under its PPA with the government. So that's how, you know, normally the risk flows down and ultimately you have to have sufficient contingencies in your EPC and also in your supply arrangements. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask Sophia, so how are you dealing with uh, this COVID situation and how are you expecting your contracting to go forward from now on? Um, I think for, for us, since we are on the developer side, as Gourmet mentioned, we are quite lucky in this region because the government have, have really shown their commitment to renewable energy, even in these times. So we saw the round three uh, in Saudi Arabia, and then we also saw yesterday the Abu Dhabi project. So that's, it's, it's a good thing for, for, for developers in this region. Uh, but on, on, on the contracting point, I think for EPC contractors, what they benefit um, from in, in this template as well is the time relief. So the projects under construction, uh, not only in renewable energy, but uh, I see in other infrastructure projects in this region, the contractors are already placed in, in claims for time relief. And thanks to the template that is most of the time allowed for. Uh, because, you know, I think for most of these projects on the construction, the, the costs with the water suppliers and so on are already locked in before the mm -hmm. COVID-19 started. So I see more of the time relief um, issue for contractors, which is kind of covered already with the, with the template. Okay, so now let's uh, talk that, about, go on. Sorry, to add to that. One thing you might see though in contracts moving forward is that projects that are in bid phase, uh, it would be hard to argue that it's a force majeure because obviously now it's contemplated. Everybody knows sure. that Corona. So one thing that you are going to see. I predict is that there will be um, new clauses. You might call it the Corona clause, but this will be built into uh, projects probably now in bid phase because obviously bidders would be very concerned to get time and cost relief. And you may not be able to rely just on the force measure provisions the way it's currently drafted because normally for force measure, you know, it's got to be something that's not foreseeable, something that's not within your control. Yeah, I suppose yeah. now no one can claim anymore. You know, you could claim on the contracts from before, but not anymore that there is yeah. like a force of that. So you probably see new and novel type of drafting that comes through that, I guess, as lawyers. The corona would... clauses. <laughs> and, and they probably stay, no? They're there to stay, uh, Gourmet. I assume, that, you know, in 50 years we will see the corona clause and we'll be like, yes. what is this? <laughs> <laughs> I think the, the, the point that Gourmet made is valid because it covers unforeseeable events, but now the event is already foreseeable and we're familiar with it. So the, the, the contractors, we need to already take into account pandemics such as Corona into their cost and time timeline, time schedule as well. And actually, this brings in another thing that's interesting because, you know, are we then going to still see these record low tariffs? Because you know, realistically, you think that if there's going to be delays, there's going to be shortages in supplies, it's going to lead to increased costs. I don't know the answer to that, but I would think that obviously, uh, if people have to build in buffers, if you have to build in contingencies because the banks are asking for it, you're going to get increased costs. And therefore, question mark, are, are we going to still be able to get these record low prices in upcoming projects? Yeah, that's a good question, actually, that I was just going to where? send to you. Go on, that's, Sophia. That's where Gourmet, the, as you mentioned before, the procurers can step in. Uh, in order to maintain uh, competitive tariffs, they can add tariff adjustment mechanisms for, for such situations, for instance, rather than inflating the tariff with contingencies from, from the beginning. But I mean, <laughs> that, that really means that the tariff that people end up paying is higher than you know, the number that is there. But anyway, let's not, let's not go into this. What happened exactly in Abu Dhabi now? We know that there was a tariff that was resolved, 13 cents, really, really cheap. Uh, I mean, 
you know, record prices. Again, we know there are like certain multipliers and the tariffs adjustments into these tariffs. Uh, this is nothing new. You know, it happens in every tender that we have in the region. Um, but it's actually uh, lower than it was before. This is what I'm given to understand. Um, so it, it was, the prices were, got readjusted halfway through. Uh, after this, you know, we knew about this corona. I would have expected this tariff to go up rather than down, you know, due to the corona crisis, so to speak, but this hasn't been the case. So I just want to leave it there for like everyone to, uh, you know, to, to, to comment on this. Um, Sophia Gourmet, I don't know if you want to start and then we can go into maybe the issues more that got to do with equipment. No, we can't hear you, hang on. I now think we can. Natu naturally, in, in, in the region, but also worldwide, we will always see a trend of, of, of more and more competitive solar PV tenders, and that is thanks to the model efficiencies. Uh, I think Amy will know best how the technology efficiency and prices are evolving very, very fast on a monthly or even weekly basis. Uh, so I think model suppliers, including uh, Longi and so on, are continually increasing the production capacity. Um, so perhaps that, that was already factored in um, uh, during this, this project and that's why we, we will always benefit from the higher bin sizes, higher efficiency, uh, you know, modern factories from the modern suppliers which uh, result into much lower uh, model prices. And in PV projects, I think it's, it's quite simple, model price is one of the main drivers in the capex. So. So I'm going to go into the module prices shortly right after this. I'd just like to ask you one more thing, Sophia. Uh, how are you guys preparing for the actual projects themselves of the future for considering all of this COVID situation? So, you know, the, the personal space, you know, because there is also a lot of uncertainty in terms of what the government is going to expect or, 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 or get, want to get, you know, from the different... Um, um, companies uh, and in different regions, you know, different countries could have different security. So how are you preparing for that? Um, as a company, perhaps my response will be different than to the other colleagues because uh, it's uh, yesterday the NG group have um, announced the, the business continuity plan. So we have actually acted around six weeks ago already on starting to, to work on the business continuity uh, to allow employees to go back to work uh, in a safe manner by the group is procuring masks at a, at the group level in large volumes and so on. But uh, as you may know, we have a lot of operating assets in this region as well. So it's very important for us, for the company to make sure everyone is healthy, but at the same time, we still deliver power and water to, to, the, to the clients. So we do have a business continuity plan to allow us to still continue working, but we did, the group also kind of issued some sorts of reliefs for some of our clients in other countries in terms of deferred payment, um, uh, deferred payment for some gas bills, for example, in Europe and so on. Um, so we are prepared. Uh, for, for us, it's, it's, it's a critical business because we have to continue delivering um, and we hope we can go back to work uh, because, you know, we also miss the human interaction. <laughs> no, for sure, for sure. I was just wondering because there is so much going on, right? And uh, just a final question before I move on to this specific port of logistics and PV prices that is very interesting and will remain there for a while. I wanted to ask the two of you, okay, in terms of the bankability and the money available, the cost of this money, how do you think, how do you see things evolving? I mean, at the moment, we're getting not only a currency crisis, an oil crisis, you know, a bunch of things. Uh, the banks do have liquidity, but are they going to invest in renewables, you know? So just leave out there for, for both of you to answer, uh, you know, from your own perspective. Like you said, you know, there is liquidity. And uh, I mean, in terms of the GCC countries, yes, there is, you know, obviously the oil price crisis and corona but uh, ultimately the fundamentals are still very strong in the region and like uh, you know they in terms of renewable projects the government so far has indicated commitment towards continuing the program so ultimately for banks I, uh, they will look at the risk and as long as the projects are structured properly and we we know the documentations are bankable then it will be a matter of uh, assessing you know the uh, kind of additional, I guess, corona risk and how that's being 
mitigated and dealt with on a project by project basis. You may see maybe certain projects where uh, you know they have already got approvals or uh, previously pre-COVID. You know, they, I have heard of some instances where um, they might be relooking some of that pricing using material adverse change type clauses in in some of these uh, loan documentation. Um, so that may happen, and that may be a question on impacting pricing, and therefore you could get a higher pricing. But I mean, I don't see it as um, an issue with liquidity or not being able to get funding if the project fundamentals are sound and you have you know, bankable documentation, which we do in this region. Sophia, anything to add? Um, no, I think I agree with, 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 with what Gomit said. The, the main issue may be with projects that are ongoing for closing will be the credit approval. I think the banks don't like uncertainty. So certainly this will impact the timeline of the approval committees from these lenders. Mm. And just on a practical level, uh, just on those projects coming to financial close as well, you will see delays because just simple things like signing of documents is now a challenge. Yeah. You know, Logistical delay. Can't get power of attorneys notarized, so that's just going to immediately already impact. On top of that, you know, in terms of registration of security, you know, in a lot of countries in the GCC, you still need to go and physically do these sort of things because you don't have electronic sort of lodgement processes. So these are like real challenges that are being faced that's going to impact on the timeline for these kind of uh, projects that are heading towards financial close. Okay, so thank you very much. So we've looked at, you know, the issues and the challenges and uh, the contractual side of like the large scale um, things. Now we're going to focus a little bit more uh, on bankability, but also a little bit more on, you know, this, how do we get the price so low? And I'll ask, uh, I'd like to ask Amy to come in here because of course, as, hang on, I'm just unmuting you. I don't know why I can't unmute you. See, see if you can unmute yourself, Amy. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. So uh, for you, I have a few questions because, of course, you know, Sophia mentioned before that, you know, these prices that we are seeing now um, in, in, in Abu Dhabi, which are unprecedented. And I think all of us expected that to the, the, the Corona clause and the post-Corona projects to have a little bit of a hike in prices. But this has come at the same time as a lowering, you know, in the cost of panels, which make up most of you know the capex of projects so um i'd like to ask amy what are the issues that you're facing right now in the business of uh, solar modules uh, due to the covid crisis uh yes uh, okay thanks Dylan. so actually now um uh, sophia and uh, gramit have shared with a lot of the good uh, opinions already so on our side you know um Okay, in our opinion, under the current crisis, and we can see the coronavirus have impacted the global market of the PV industry. Actually, you know, it's not only for solar business, but also for the others. And if, if we divide this pandemic into the four stages, like the outbreak, the initial control, and the remission period, and the final control, and we'll see, okay, Currently, in Europe, we saw the major countries having large, uh, I mean, the major countries having large the demand of the solar products and have entered the remain, remission period. I mean, it becomes better, situation becomes better. So therefore, we expect the market can be recovered soon. However, um, we also see, um, in some other countries like the Latin, the Southeast Asia, even the Middle East and Africa, the pandemic is still spreading. So it will affect us to carry out some real business in some emerging market of these areas. So this is the, uh, some, some circumstance we, uh, we have seen uh, currently. But while, you know, we also see the outbreak um, will influence the global trade. For instance, you know, nearly every country have set the transport control and the consumer demand is falling now. So this is the truth. As a, re as a result, you know, we expect the global trade will continue to decline. Um, for, some, for some big customers, 
you know, they, they are having the international business. And uh, however, you know, recently they have stated they would rather to slow down their investment to, the, uh, to some of the affected areas of uh, uh, outbreak. So, and coming back to uh, our solar market, you know, before the outbreak, uh, the global installation capacity stayed the continuous increase. So as far as we already know, the, the modules capacity have been doubled since the year 2016. If I remember correctly, uh, the production capacity, uh, global production capacity in 2016 is around 120 gigawatts. And now it's more or less the 250 gigawatts. But however, you know, due to the the coronavirus and we expect the capacity will decline from the first time in 2020. So in that case, uh, how to, so how to balance the supply and the demand and how to manage the supply chain will become the most task for each module manufacturers. So, uh, so far we couldn't have the, uh, the whole view about the, uh, how the coronavirus to in, impact the supply chain. However, uh, we, we have, uh, everybody has seen the, um, the current market demand uh, is declining, but the production capacity is still there. So this is a crucial problems we are facing at this moment. And how will the situation affect the bankability of current and future projects? Um, how to see? Um, so, Balin, you know, in, um, okay, in our opinion, you know, under the current situation, we expect the PV industry will face the situation of the reshuffling. So, it could be happened, actually, you know. For lots of the manufacturers, they might be struggling uh, with their own financial crisis at this moment. And we don't know whether they could survive or not. And therefore, you know, we believe the lenders, the banks, and will become more cautious uh, when they evaluate the bankability of the solar manufacturers. So, uh, um, the financial, so uh, in our opinion, you know, the financial health, the brand reputation, and the one company's sustainability will become the key criteria. Um, and that will be assessed by the lenders and the banks. Uh, on the other hand, we also saw lots of the customers and especially working for the utility skill project. They are not only selecting the uh, one module supplier among the tier one list pro provided by, for example, provided by the Bloomberg, but also check the company's debt ratio and their brand reputation in the market. So this is quite important. So for instance, let's see the large scale project in the Middle East. And, and everybody knows the market is, has a very high competition. And we just got the, the price information yesterday about the Abu Dhabi 1.5 uh, gigawatt. And the, I, the, the IPPs, the developers. And so as a bidder, they always chase the lowest price for the equipment. But on the other hand, we also saw they, always, they, are, they are also always cheese, the advanced technology. So this is very, 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 uh, you know, special market. And today, actually not at today, it's not so difficult for the IPPs to get the cheap modules in the market. As we all know, more and more the, uh, the manufacturers are able to commit they are able to supply the advanced technology, uh, technological uh, product. So, but however, you know, under the current crisis, how to ensure the, you know, the bankruptcy will be not happened to their selected supplier. So in my point of view, you know, to evaluate one supplier, the financial capability and their uh, brand, their branding, their brand, the reputations in the market will be very high important. So this is um, my opinion, our opinion, um, based on the current situation. Thank you very much, Amy. Uh, I have some more questions for you. Um, what are the main factors that will be considered evaluated by lenders to module manufacturers when you finance uh, 
when when they they, they finance um, PV projects or large scale PV projects, whether they're investors, IPP developers, etc. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Barry, you know, uh, as I have mentioned just now, you know, uh, indeed, I mean, um, we have seen there's some factors will influence the lenders. So, first of all, the financial health is quite important. It has become more, I mean, most one most important factor uh, for one module manufacturers. It will be considered by the lender. So, and secondly, uh, we think the vertically integrated manufacturers will become more considered bankable. So, and thirdly, uh, we think the, like, like I have mentioned, uh, the brand reputation with the innovative uh, technology and the good product quality. Um, so we we'll, are we'll also important when the lender do assessment to the module manufacturers. So, um, so on our side, you know, as, as for the PV, for example, as for the PV technology, and we saw it uh, has upgraded very fast in the past three years. And more and more, the new generation modules have been introduced to be used for the large scale project. So therefore, you know, the module suppliers, as a module supplier, we have actually, we have the opportunity to provide the track records to prove these modules the, has a very strong stability and uh, has a very good performance on the you know, power generation stage. So we think this is the key factors uh, will be considered by the lenders in future. Excellent, and one final question. Uh, and what do you think um, about the importance of modules bankability itself? Okay, well, um, how do you say, you know, uh, as we all know, you know, um, the solar panels, I mean, whatever the, the bidding price is, is going down continually. And then the solar modules is the very core equipment in, uh, for in one solar project. So, you know, uh, when we are determined to invest the solar power plant as one equity, and we will hope to make a profit from it for a long term, for a long run. So in general, we think the module manufacturers provide the long-term warranties Typically, it's the 25 year or the 30 years. So, but as well, you know, the manufacturers will commit to supply the modules with very good quality. It lose, it can match the investor's requirement. So there's no problem. But however, you know, it's not enough. Since we have seen lots of the module supplier, they have gone bankrupt in the past decades. You know, while we have, we have ever considered that they were successful with the quality product. So therefore, in, in our opinion, and it will be quite important for one manufacturer to have a financial health and stay the long-term sustainability of their business in the market. We think this is uh, uh, the key. This is a key point. And we believe, so this is a main factor to consider the bankability of your module uh, manufacturers and uh, as well you know um if if some manufacturer they can be bankable it can help to, uh, help the investors to achieve their bankabilities uh, of their solar uh, solar power plant so basically um we propose i mean we propose the uh, investors the ipps they select the modules from the tier one manufacturers and usually you know the modules their modules have been dominated the bankability in the past two to three years. And, and while, you know, uh, we also propose the investor require um, your selected supplier to provide you uh, one third party insurance. Uh, you know, generally uh, some big customers will ask us uh, to provide the, 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 some product insurance and liability insurance. So we think this this is uh, this this can become one security for the investors, and because you know uh, they might be the for for their selected module suppliers they might be out of the solar business prior the 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 twenty five years. So, but however you know the warranties will be taken by the insurance policies. So this is also uh, the very important, 
and furthermore, you know, the branding reputation and the uh, with the financial health, uh, we think it is um, can be defined as the uh, bankability. And based on it, the banks compiles their own whitelist of the Sora module brand. Um, and that, uh, I think, you know, the banks will feel comfortable with it. So, so in general, right. you know, ben, yeah, yeah. We, we think this is the, the key factors. And uh, uh, if we want to become uh, more competitive under the current uh, situation, um, we have to improve from these factors, yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much, Amy. And of course, you know, the panels being like the largest part of the of, of the project in terms of CAPEX, but inverters are also important. And there are people here asking, you know, what about inverters? So Alvin, I'm going to unmute your microphone and I'm going to ask you, I mean, can you give me the perspective of the inverters? You know, as we discussed, there is in terms of bankability considerations and also see if you can mention a little bit about prices and what's going on right now with uh, with that. Yes, okay. Thanks, Glenn. So explain, as explained by Sophia and uh, I mean, so under current stressed uh, global environment, the financing institution will check the bankability of each key components more and more strictly, especially for these large scale PB projects, such as the panels, trackers, or inverters, etc. The purpose of doing this is avoiding or minimizing the bankability issue for the project. Then how to identify the credit worthness of all the bankability of those key components manufacturers. So I will start to take for inverter, for example. So the first thing will be yes, there will be uh, there will, are only a few pure play public solar inverter manufacturers. Most of the inverters are active in the wider power distribution sector, like Schneider or are a part of a large business like ABB. For those kinds of manufacturers, inverters business just take a small portion of your main business. As we know, especially in these MENA regions, almost each of the large scale PA projects, when the bid autumn up, its PPA price always breaks the world's lowest record. The margin for the key components are going net and net. So, and uh, French gained to Schneider Electronics left the utility scale inverter business in February 2019. And um, ABB also announces in July 9, 2019 its existing its inverter business. This will bring potential for the financial risk, especially for the large scale PV project. And uh, the second point is that because the complexity of the inverters make local sports an important bankability criteria. Inverters are much more complicated than modules, as they consist of hundreds of components. Some of the components have a lifetime of five to seven years. After that, a lot of them needs to be replaced. Hence, after service becomes very important. Do manufacturers provide local uh, technical support? Do they have uh, customer service locally? Or do they have a uh, permanent stock of coil components in the relevant region? Those are the basic questions we need to know before choosing the right manufacturer. So in the meanwhile, while in several, all components can be swept out. In practice, sometimes the whole inverter needs to be replaced. It is often because the inverter manufacturers is no longer in this industry, which can become a costly affair. And uh, thirdly, the point is the quality and the reliability of the key components. As we know for large scale PV projects, system performance rates is one of the key parameters Quality and reliability depends on design, manufacturing, and the component selections. Because the high pressure of the PPA price here, the competition, uh, and the competition, some manufacturer design products with cheaper or unverified components or new technology for them, uh, which is used against bodies such as the forced air coolings. And uh, in MENA regions, most of the large scale PV projects are installed in harsh environments, such as high environment temperature, dust, and high humidity. Do manufacturers consider this to design, this to design their products or not? So each large scale PV project, the site condition is different. Sometimes maybe the spring is the best fit, and sometimes central will have a better LCOE. So, does the project design consider this when they select the right technology or not? So this is the answer we need to 
make sure before we choose the right manufacturer. Last but not least, the supply chain and turnkey solutions. Some emerging manufacturers are just assemblers, while the others are fully integrated and buy all the components by themselves. So that's the opinion I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much, uh, Alvin. Okay, let me ask you just a few questions. We don't have a lot of time left. So a few of the questions that people have sent through and you know, feel free to open your mics and you know, say, hey, I wanna answer that. If not, then I'll nominate someone. <laughs> but hopefully you guys will be like up for it. Um, so this is really simple. It says, do you think that post COVID-19 we will see more involvement from the DFI rather than commercial? rather than commercial banks to finance po power and water projects. So, Sophia, I see you are like that. I, I wish I had the answer to that. I mean, we, I think it will depend, but maybe that's more of a, a question for other markets than GCC, right? I mean, it will make sense that DFIs will step in for uh, other markets such as Africa, such as East Asia, and so on, to make sure uh, the projects still go on. Um, yeah, I think that's right, uh, because I mean, typically we do see DFIs operate in, you know, some of the markets like Jordan, Egypt, countries like that, but not really GCC. Mm. And I think that's because, you know, as said before, the fundamentals in GCC, strong liquidity is still there. The banks are, you know, lending. It's just a matter of making sure that these risks, these additional risks are identified and managed and they get comfortable because they'll have to convince their credit approval committees that these can all be managed. Sure. I mean, a lot of the companies are operating out of the UAE as well in all of those countries. So, it, it you know, it begs the question see if, you know, these countries are have issues with the bankability, the, the, the companies themselves might, might, might run into trouble. Um, so this is, you know, I think it's, it's a good point that they, they were asking here, you know, uh, to what extent w would the financial institutions like step in? Um, do you believe that the current situation could result in increased focus on local manufacturing or local procurement for products and solutions, especially in the Middle East and North Africa region? I think that, that reminds me of the example of Apple, right? Uh, I think when there was the lockdown in China, Apple realized that most of their, um, mm. some of their conductors were, were made in China and then now they're trying to set factories in the US. I think it will apply for all industries, not only renewables, that people will rethink, as Alvin said, their O&M strategies as to having a stock, uh, you know, more spare parts and so on, or maybe having local suppliers for some critical components locally. Uh, to kind of mitigate this, this kind of risks in the future. Yeah, and I think you've seen also, uh, you know, different governments having different stimulus packages to try and encourage that, uh, although not, you know, directly related. But I think one thing we've seen recently is in UAE, for example, they've now announced, uh, you know, certain sectors where you can have 100% private sector, uh, like uh, foreign ownership. Uh, this is a new, you know, development, of course, there's been a change in the company's law recently, but then the sectors in which that could happen wasn't fully finalized until recently, but people see that as a positive step, it would encourage, you know, uh, investment and companies coming into this part of the world uh, to practice in that sectors and renewable energy is one of that sectors. Excellent. I'm going to ask one more question and then we'll say uh, bye for today. If there's any questions that you'd like to answer, you know, take a look at the list, then by all means, let me know. But I have a question here for both Amy and Alvin. And it says, as the competition, as the, the price of PV is falling, you know, because, you know, the PPA's prices are getting more and more competitive, um, will this create a, neg a negative impact on uh, manufacturers to keep the, to keep your, your margins essentially and still maintain the quality? Yes, I think this will be a big, really a big pressure, especially for the inverters. You know, so we see there's a highly competition here, here, no matter for the panels, but also for the inverters here. And indeed, it will be, uh, it will be um, some kind, if we want to achieve those kind of a target, uh, we need to consider to use the alternative suppliers. But uh, in the meanwhile, you also need to maintenance 
your quality, make sure they still be qualified and uh, uh, the system design or the emotor design is the, based on your company's culture. Right, but uh, in the, I think some other competitor maybe choose some cheaper components, key components. But uh, for Sangro, we always believe, you know, uh, bring the most, uh, most, uh, most valuable products in the market. Yeah, so is, is, is it like a, a difficult equation, right? Like to keep those yeah. prices going down and at the same time, especially for panels, Amy, you guys are the ones that have like the biggest responsibility because this is the largest CAPEX. Yes, you know, you know, Balin, actually, um, you, you are truth. Uh, some issues, I mean, uh, you, you just mentioned how to manage the, the product with a very good quality, as well as the, 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 the product, the solar product price is going down continually. So how to balance and how to manage it very well to satisfy it to the customers. And uh, I, we, in, in, in our opinion, actually, you know, uh, it has been, it, it has happened already. It has happened, uh, but for some, for some manufacturers, if you are running the whole production chain, it will be very easy for you to manage the production cost. So you, that means that you can maintain the production cost from the early beginning, and then you can deliver your, your raw materials to the solar panel, for example, to the solar panels uh, very well. But I mean, um, if waste, if, okay, if let's see, let's see the, the whole PV market, let's see the whole energy market. Actually, if we have started some analysis report, we will see uh, not only for solar, but also for wind energy has become the most competitive, the energy op options in the, in the market. So, I mean, based on this market trend, we will see it can be, it should be actually, it should be competitive with the, with the other energies like the oil and gas, like the coal energy. So this is a trend, how to, how to compete with the coal energy so that the, 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 the developers, the investors have the, the strong uh, interest to invest the wind energy and solar energy. So the key point is we have to we have to um, lower our price. We have to uh, manage the production cost very well so that the investors um, can, you know, manage their cap capex. Can, you know, so we, we think this is important. Uh, actually, um, even, even there's no coronavirus, so, uh, we still have the obligations to manage the production cost. Uh, as well, you know, uh, if we want to uh, su uh, su uh, survive in the market, we have to improve our technology in order to keep on the, on, the, on the one side, we have the competitive on price, but on the other side, we have the innovative technology with the good, good quality. So Berlin, you must be very familiar with the market of the Middle East. You know, for those IPPs, they are not only choosing the, the very, very lowest price, they have the very high technology requirement actually. So compared, uh, we, we, we started their, their technical conditions uh, on, their, you know, on their contract. It's quite strict, it's quite tough, even compared with the IPPs coming from the spam from the LATAM. So, so. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for being here today. We have run out of time, but I just wanted to say that considering what's just happened in Abu Dhabi and all of the things that we discussed here today, the Middle East might yet actually set the stage for everyone else around the country to follow. So thank you very much, all of the panelists, Alvin, Amy, Sophia, and of course, to Gurmeet, and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.